Hello. In this video, we are going to describe some of the important features of the electrically conducting polymer polyanilin. So, top we see the monomer aniline, so we have an amino benzene. Now, when we start to add uh, amine groups, Notice that in phenylene diamine, we have the two amino groups that are um, powered to each other. And now if we oxidize that particular um, moiety there, we can oxidize it to a 1,4-quinone diamine. So we notice that the quinone form and the benzenoid form have different energies. And that's one of the keys that we exploit in electrically conducting polymers. If we're dealing with a chain of many aniline groups, we call it polyanilin. If we only have a handful of monomers, then we call them oligoanilin. And one feature that the oligo and polyanilins have in common is that they have, just like the phenylene diamine, they have multiple oxidation states. So by convention, we refer to the most reduced oxidation state, so the most benzenoid one, that's the one we see at the bottom here, and we call that leucoemaldine. The intermediate oxidation state, so when we're dealing with uh, three rings here, we have one that's a quinoid and two that are benzenoid. So this intermediate oxidation state we call the emeraldine, the, particularly the emeraldine base form for reasons we'll see in a little bit. And then the most oxidized form, where here we have two quinoid rings and only one benzenoid, we call the pernagranulin state. So that's the most oxidized form of our oligo or polyanilin. Most of the typical synthesis methods actually generate the poly or oligoanilin in the leucoemaldine form, the most reduced form. However, this particular form is not stable to oxygen in the air, and it oxidizes very easily to the emeraldine base form. If you uh, store leucoemeraldine under a nitrogen atmosphere for a while, for example, um, then it will stay in the leucoemeraldine form almost indefinitely. Now, if we want to go in the opposite direction, we want to go from emeraldine base to leucoemeraldine, then we use something like hydrazine or phenylhydrazine is a sufficiently strong reducing agent to uh, reduce it from emeraldine to leucoemeraldine. Because of this uh, stability, generally when we encounter uh, either polyanilin or oligoanilin, they tend to be in the emeraldine base state. Now, to convert it to pernagranulin, even something like 3% hydrogen peroxide will work slowly. But if you want to do that quickly, 30% uh, hydrogen peroxide will do the trick. We can generally recognize that we have changed oxidation states with the oligo or polyanilins because we will get a change in color. Now, if we want to go from the pernagranulin state, back to the intermediate emeraldine form, then sodium borohydride is quite effective. We don't need anything quite as strong as a hydrazine or a hydrazine. Sodium borohydride uh, in aqueous solution works quite well to achieve that. So we see that the accessibility of different oxidation states is one of the important features of uh, aniline chemistry. These anilines also exhibit important acid-base behavior. Typically, when the emeraldine form is most effective in conducting electricity, 
or in inhibiting corrosion of a metal surface, it's going to be in the emeraldine hydro dihydrochloride form. So it's going to be in the form of a salt, it acting like a base, reacting with a strong acid, something like sulfuric acid or hydrochloric acid. And calculations have shown that the imine nitrogens, where we have the uh, double bond to nitrogen, are more basic than is ordinary uh, amino uh, nitrogen that we find uh, capped at the end of our uh, emeraldine base. When synthesizing the oligomers, particularly the trimers, uh, we use the 1,4-phenylene diamine as our central unit, and we react it with ammonium persulfate, which is a strong oxidizing agent, which converts the uh, phenylene diamine into a form where it is a, an excellent electrophile. And we can exploit the fact that it will undergo electrophilic aromatic substitution. Notice that uh, amines, uh, aromatic amines, because the amine group are strongly activated towards substitution. Another tricky feature of these oligoanalins is the fact that, uh, despite what we might predict, they're not linear and planar. So, uh, with reference to the central imine uh, nitrogens, we can either have the external rings can be on the same side or they can be on opposite sides. So here we have them being on the opposite side. So the trans conformation. And here we see the other possibility where the rings are on the same side of the uh, double bounded nitrogens. So this is going to be the cis or sin conformation. Now the uh, computed energies of the different isomers uh, are very, very close. So we can't automatically predict whether the cis or the trans conformation is going to be favored for any particular oligoanalyst. So here are just some examples of some uh, structures that we're able to incorporate in the outer ring just by starting with aniline here, um, ortho diamino uh, aniline here, and um, the one with a carboxyl group right next to amine, which is known colloquially as anthranilic acid. Because hydroxyl uh, phenolic groups activate the ring just like an amine group does, we can also easily incorporate hydroxyl groups on the outer rings by starting with, at the left we have phenol, in the center we have catechol, and on the right we have both a phenol and carboxylic acid functionality in the same ring, and that is salicylic acid. And one last set of examples of um, different outer rings that we can use. At the left there, we have the meta-hydroxyl groups. That's called resorcinol. And then we have the uh, two-hydroxy aniline in the center. And then we also have a uh, two-methyl aniline, showing that we can also incorporate uh, alkyl groups quite easily. And since we have aromatic amines at the ends of our molecule, then we have access to other structures by using the Sandmeyer reactions. So one class of uh, modifications we were able to make quite easily using a Sandmeyer reaction was to replace the terminal amino groups by halogens. In particular, um, chlorine, bromine, and iodide 
are uh, relatively straightforward to incorporate into the uh, oligo -aniline. And we finished up this introduction by just uh, showing what computer structures for some of the uh, original and novel oligoanalins. You can see that the uh, light gray is carbon, the blue uh, spheres are nitrogens, the red spheres are oxygen. So we see uh, two oligoanalins with uh, essentially anthranilic acid on either end, and we see quite clearly that these are uh, not linear and they're not planar, and that plays a big uh, part in some of the technological uses of oligoanalyte. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Stay healthy, stay safe, and as always, have a good one.